It's great to have you in God's house today. Let's stand together. Would you welcome those around you to worship? We're glad you're here. Throughout these Sundays, we've celebrated Advent and lit the Advent wreath and the purple candles representing Christ's passion for us, the pink candle, Jesus being the rose of Sharon, and Christ's humility. On Christmas Eve, we'll light the Christ candle, which is the one in the middle. Today, we light the candle of joy. I'd like to invite Tabea Lambrecht from Heidelberg, Germany, to come and read our scripture for us today. I'm reading in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 to 14. Der Engel aber sagte zu ihnen, fürchtet euch nicht, denn ich verkünde euch frohe Botschaft. Heute ist euch in der Stadt Davids der Retter geboren. Er ist der Messias, der Herr. Und das soll euch als Zeichen dienen. Ihr werdet ein Kind in Windeln gewickelt in einer Krippe finden. Auf einmal waren sie umgeben von unzähligen Engeln, die Gott lobten. Ehre sei Gott in der Höhe und Frieden auf Erden und den Menschen ein Wohlgefallen. Jesus is the light of the world, the light for every nation. Well, it sure is good seeing you today. Thank you for being here on this fourth Sunday of Advent. The Sunday just before Christmas, and what a wonderful day it is. Hope you're planning on coming back Christmas Eve, either at 5 or 6.30, as we will share in candlelight and communion and carols. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. We've got a lot of folks already gone, and maybe you've come in for the holidays, and if you're our guest today, a special welcome to you. 
We want you to take a communication card and fill it out and then hold on to it because at the end of the service, when the offering plate comes by, we'd like for you to drop that in. Tell us about yourself, how we can pray for you, and we will surely do it. Among those worshiping with us by internet, uh, Tabea's parents in Heidelberg. I want to welcome Maria and Michael watching from Heidelberg, and I know you're proud of your daughter. We love her here. She's uh, an active part of our church. Well, I want the Edmondsons to come up here and join with me. There's somebody they want you to meet. I think you already know Elizabeth, who's three years old. But Mance and Sarah have a baby they want us to meet. Come on out here. This little one is Austin Mance Edmondson. And what a good-looking fella. Yeah. I married you, didn't I, several years ago now, and look what God has done, what God has given you. Well, Elizabeth says she remembers this. I don't know if she does or not, <laughs> but you'll have to tell her all, tell uh, uh, Austin all about it in days to come. It's really for you more than for him. It's your promises you make. So let me ask you, are you committing yourselves today to raising Austin in a Christian home? Will you teach him all about Jesus and his ways? As he gets older, will you seek to win him to faith in Christ for himself? And as these, both of these children grow up, will you let us continue to have a part in it? We want to invest in them and help them to grow. Well, you've selected a wonderful verse for Austin from Psalm 91. Listen, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. That's a wonderful promise from God. Can I, can I hold him? All right. He just woke, we were sitting together. He just woke up about two minutes ago, like maybe some of you did. And, <laughs> but look at him. Isn't he just precious? Let's pray for him. Father, thank you for all your gifts to your children. But today, especially at this Christmas season, we thank you for babies. And I thank you for Austin. I pray he'll grow up strong and handsome and that he'll be a man of character and great courage and that you'll do wonderful things through his life and the life of his sister. Bless this home. Keep them strong and in your will. And give these parents wisdom, strength, patience, and lots of love for the days to come. We commit this one to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there a story about this outfit? It is so precious. Is it in the family or anything? It is. It is. My grandmother made it for my father. Your grandmother made it for your father. Well, wonderful. All right. Well, Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. We are in the, uh, the uh, season for missions at our church. We have a team right now. You saw them last Sunday, but right now they're in Central Asia sharing the gospel. And we got another team. Some are in the room right now. They're leaving tomorrow for another place in Central Asia to make a difference for Christ. So we are a going church. And, and you're giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. The last number I heard, so far we've raised about $185,000 in that Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And uh, we're well on our way. We're not there yet. The goal is 272000 But I have every confidence we'll make it. If you've not given yet to that, maybe today. You'll add yours to what's already been received. But one thing we can all do, and that is to pray. So I want us to pray right now for our people and others who are serving Christ in faraway places today. Father, we thank you that you, in your great sovereignty, invite us to join you in what you're doing in the world. And you've called men and women from our church to go, and they're going. And Lord, you invite us to pray, and we're praying and, Lord, you encourage us to give, and we're giving. Lord, today I pray for our people on the field and thousands of others who are serving you. I ask you to keep them safe and strong as they serve in sometimes very difficult, dangerous places and give them joy in their service. And, Lord, take care of their families back at home. We commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
desperately waiting. We long for the day when all is revealed. Promise spoken by angels, Savior from heaven, given to Jesus, chosen Messiah, our God is with us, Emmanuel. The windows of heaven finally open. God is here. Wonderful Counselor, never changing, never ending, beautiful.
maybe our all-time favorite Christmas carol, Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Bright. Would you stand and let's sing it together? Probably is everybody's favorite Christmas carol, and that's how we'll end the service on Christmas Eve with lighted candles. So I hope you're going to be here to share in it with us. Today we've been hearing music that's kind of echoes of the living Christmas tree. You were here and you heard how beautiful and wonderful it was. The song the choir just did is my favorite. I was telling Mance a few moments ago, this is my favorite song because I think it's the perfect combination of words and theology behind them and lights. Paul Eskridge and his crew put this wonderful thing together, and it really is genius the way they do it, 80 to 100,000 lights on that tree. And on this particular song, you know, it started with a duet, and then the choir comes in, and it gets real big, and then they, they bring it down back to just the duet. And I remember thinking, well, this is it. They're going to end very softly, very gently. 
And then the choir comes back in. And on that last little bit, from the base of the tree, the lights begin to move up until that finally God is with us, everlasting God. A big explosion at the top of the tree. And I come out of my seat every time I hear it. I just think that's joy. That's what we're talking about when we talk about joy. Well, Tobea read the scripture from Luke chapter 2, and you don't need to turn there. so familiar to all of us. Uh, the angel appearing to the shepherds and saying, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Great joy. Every time I read that scripture, I think of my favorite Christmas story. It's about four-year-old Ava at her preschool Christmas program. She played the part of an angel. She had one line. It was that line. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Well, the moment came. She, closed, she moved over to the front of the stage. Her parents are down on the front row with their iPhones and cameras and all the rest, ready to capture the moment. And just then, little Ava froze. Has that ever happened to you? You had a line in a play, and it just escaped you. She froze. She, she didn't know what to do. And it was a long, long silence, and, and she begins to tear up because she's embarrassed, and her parents are agonizing for her. Everybody's mouthing the words, trying to remind her. And finally, the light bulb comes on, and with a big smile across her face, she exclaims, Boy, have I got good news for you. which isn't exactly what the angel said, but Ava got the gist of it, didn't she? Christmas is all about the most wonderful news that anybody had ever heard in that first century world, the best, most glorious news anybody's heard since, the greatest news I've ever heard, that God has come to us in Christ, Emmanuel, God is with us. He came out of love to redeem us, to ransom us, that we might have everlasting life. That's what joy is all about. Well, I looked up joy in the dictionary, and the dictionary has a slightly different definition. Uh, the dictionary defines joy as the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. It's an emotion that is determined by circumstances. Well, that's not how I define it. I don't think that's what it means. I think joy is a Christian word. And it's not speaking about momentary happiness, but rather is speaking about a basic disposition of the heart. When you know Christ, you have a different perspective on life and everything in it. And that is the settled disposition of joy. Happiness is something else. Happiness is dependent on what's going on around you in the moment. Last night, uh, Audrey and I went to the Redskins game. You know, the Redskins haven't been doing so well. They've not won many games, but they won last night. And I'm not taking a lot of credit for that. I, I was just there. But I'm sitting there, and I've only been to one NFL game in my life, and it was a preseason game, and it was several years ago. And I had forgotten how, uh, how profane and vulgar sometimes the crowd can be at an NFL game. I mean, just the language was just atrocious all around us. But what I really noticed was every time RG3 did something great, the crowd was ecstatic. He was the best in the land. But five minutes later, he'd do something wrong. He'd make a mistake, and that same crowd would turn on him with vulgar profanity, get him out of here, we should have never gotten him here, all the rest. One minute you're up, one, one minute you're down. That's how fickle we are. And if you live your life dependent on what just happened, the latest thing, then you're going to be up and down too. Joy is something different. Joy comes when we know Christ. Now, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 51. 
Isaiah 51 is not a Christmas text, but it is a prophecy about the children of Israel one day going back into their land from captivity, which they did. And this is a prophecy about it, but I think it applies to Christmas, and I think it definitely applies to us. Look at chapter 51, verse 11. 51, verse 11. The ransomed of the Lord, that's us. You've been ransomed. A price was paid that you might be set free. It was the precious blood of Jesus, our Savior. It wasn't your righteousness. It wasn't what you did. It's what he provided on the cross that ransoms us. The ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This morning we're talking about joy, and I want to give you three or four things about joy. On the back of your order of worship insert, there's some space where you can jot these four things down, and later they'll prompt your memory of today, and maybe you can share them with others. Number one, joy always surprises us. We weren't looking for it. It happened when we least expected it. The text here says gladness and joy will overtake them. They're on their way. They're headed in a direction. And then joy catches up from behind and surprises. This may not be the best day to remind you of it, but you remember back in the summer, those hot, lazy days of summer? And you had a guest with you over on the mall, and it was just oppressively hot. But every now and then, you would step into a breeze, a gentle breeze. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going next. You don't know how long it's going to last. You're going to step out of it in a moment. But for that moment, that breeze just filled you with joy. I was trying to think this week, what, uh, what brings that to me? When do I feel most joyous? And I was sitting in my office, and I, I had just written down, when I see somebody I haven't seen in a while and I wasn't expecting to see. And as soon as I wrote that, I looked up, and at my door was standing uh, Alex Travis and uh, Anna Maria, who used to be in our choir. She lives in another place now. But she was in town, and he brought her in, and I just lit up with joy. I wasn't expecting it. I didn't think I was going to see them that day, and I just felt joy. And then it got better when she showed me her hand, and there was a diamond ring on it. And she had great joy because they're engaged to be married. You weren't expecting it, a sudden surprise. During the Living Christmas Tree, I come to every performance because I love it so much. I've been to every performance for the last 10 years because I want to talk to people. I want to see folks before they see the tree, and then I want to talk to them afterwards. And uh, a lot of times out there in the lobby, folks think I'm Roger because, they, you know, they sit in the back, and I'm wearing a tuxedo, and he's wearing one, and, and you know, and, and so they think I'm Roger, and, and one of us is being complimented when they do that. But they, 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 they grab me, and they say... They often say, thank you so much for all your hard work in putting this together. And I graciously accept. <laughs> I mean, why complicate things? I'll tell Roger about it eventually. But, but the other night, listen, the other night I was standing out there, and this older lady came by, and she grabbed my hand and pulled me into her face, and she said, this is the greatest Christmas music I have ever heard. It is absolutely beautiful. I've never heard better. And she said, and I'm Jewish. And then quickly she added, and I'm not converting either, you understand. <laughs> Maybe she saw a light come on in my eye. She said, I'm not converting, but still, it was the greatest Christmas. And I thought, well, you know, Saul of Tarsus probably said something like that once upon a time. I'm not converting. But he did when he was surprised by joy. If you want to read a book this Christmas that, will, that could change your life, it's a book somebody recommended to me three or four years ago when it first came out by Laura Hillenbrand, Unbroken. It's the story of the Olympian World War II hero, Louis Zepparini, who just died not too long ago. 
unbroken. It is an incredible book, incredible. I read it because somebody wanted me to, and, I, and so I began it, and I couldn't put it down. It was just riveting. But I was two-thirds of the way through the book before I realized where this story was going. Because Louis Zepparini's greatest moment was that day when he met Jesus Christ as his Savior, and it's all in this book. Christmas Day, a movie is coming out. Angelina Jolie produced it, Unbroken. And they don't make much of that moment, but you know, you will know when you see the film, that his life changed dramatically when he met Christ. And he wasn't expecting to. In fact, he was adamant he was not going to do it. But he was surprised by joy. Joy surprises us when we are not expecting it, and those shepherds were not expecting it, but the angel came with the announcement. Here's something else. Joy often comes after tears, after tears, and you realize it because of the great contrast. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for the night, but... Joy comes in the morning. You've had some nights of many tears, haven't you? When you couldn't sleep, tossing and turning, agonizing over some great disappointment in your life. Weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Isaiah 51 again, verse 11. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. What brings tears to our hearts and eyes? most notably when somebody dies. Isn't that true? Somebody close to us dies. I'm very aware today that Christmas is not everybody's favorite holiday. It may not be yours because of some memory of long ago or maybe somebody is no longer with you who used to make it such a wonderful time of the year. In the drama at the Living Christmas Tree, Paul Jordan's character at one point uh, he's not very much into Christmas at all, and he's asked about it, and he explains that, that his mother was the heart of Christmas for their family, and she died, and it was not the, the same again ever. And uh, we had with us our neighbor that night, and uh, later afterwards we went uh, home and had some dessert, and he told us, I'd forgotten this, he told us that that spoke to him because his mother just died a few months ago. That spoke to his heart. Yeah, tears. We go through the valley of darkest gloom. But listen, on the other side of it is joy. Joy causes sadness and weeping, sighing and crying to flee because of what the Bible says is next. Imagine the day, the wonderful day, when we stand on that shore. We've crossed the river, and now we're there in the presence of God and we see those loved ones we never thought we'd see again. And there they are. And there's Christ Jesus himself. We will have weeping and sorrow in this world. But Jesus said, I have overcome the world. You will grieve, he says, but your grief will be turned to joy. No matter what you're going through today, this is not the final word. It isn't over yet. Don't despair. You don't know enough to despair. You don't have the whole picture yet. Count on the promise of God that he will be with you. The Bible says in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And sometimes you take that joy on credit. You take it in anticipation of the day it finally comes true. Something else. Joy must be shared to get the most out of it, you've got to share it. Mark Twain said that. Grief can take care of itself, he said. But to get the full value of joy, you must have somebody to divide it with. We grieve sometimes alone. We shouldn't, but sometimes we do. We, we get through it. But when joy fills your heart, you've just got to tell somebody. That's what you do on Facebook and Twitter. Something good happens to you. You have to tell the world. What good is it if nobody knows that it happened to you? And so you share it. The greatest thing that ever happened to you is that you were ransomed. You were bound in sin, a slave to the evil one, and you got rescued. 
The ransom was paid, and now you are free. And if that's happened to you, you've just got to tell somebody. That's what missions is all about. That's what this church is all about. Isaiah 51 again. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. One way we share our joy is by singing. We do a lot of that around here. Singing. The world doesn't sing that much. Have you noticed that? They don't have a song. And the songs they do have, often, have you listened to the words? How negative they are? How sad they sometimes are? We sing for joy. And it says here that joy crowns their heads. And I think that means it shows it shows in our eyes and on our face. People ought to know it when they've been around us. There's something different. It shows. When you have joy, you've got to share it. This Christmas, I want you to share that joy. Stop keeping it to yourself. It's too good for that. There are people who need to know Christ and His love. But I want to give you one more thing, and maybe you've never thought of this. You and I, you and I bring joy to God. He brings joy to us, His salvation, but we bring joy to Him. Zephaniah, write this one down. Zephaniah, a little prophet in the Old Testament. Zephaniah 3, verse 17. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Did you know that God sings? You sing, but did you know God sings? And what does he sing about? He sings with joy, happy songs. He sings about you. Because the day you met Christ and your sins were all taken away and you became his child, that brought joy to his heart. Let me show you one more verse. Turn to Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3 We've spent some time there this week, uh, this month of Advent, Ephesians chapter 3. I remember when we first moved to uh, Alexandria a little over nine years ago, we were visiting in some of your homes. I noticed in a lot of your homes that you had a wall with pictures or maybe a table with some pictures of famous Washingtonians you have met, maybe political figures, you're, you're seen there shaking their hand, you were at a reception somewhere, and I was just in awe of that because I just love that sort of thing, and I would stand and you would tell me who these individuals were, and they said, this is our bragging wall or our bragging table. These are the people that we have met, and they said, if you live here long enough, Don, you'll have one of these one day, and sure enough, after nine years, I got one too. You come to my house and you'll see pictures of various people we've had the pleasure of meeting. Well, look at this text, chapter 3, verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel, Paul says, by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent, now watch this, his intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the reasons that God came into this world as Jesus of Nazareth, one of the reasons Christ died to ransom you, was that you might become a trophy of his grace. He's got you on the wall. He has you framed on a table. He is showing the universe what his love and grace accomplish. The angels primarily, you know, the angels don't know a lot about salvation. They, uh, they're announcers of God's goodness and grace. They give glory to God constantly, but they don't really understand salvation. 
I mean, you understand it better than they do. But he's showing them. He's showing them when he shows them your picture. You are a trophy of his grace. It brings him joy to talk about you and to sing over you his wonderful, wonderful joy. Happiness is like a uh, thermometer. It measures the temperature at your house. Joy is more like the thermostat that sets the temperature in your life. Where are you setting it? Do you have the joy of the Lord? I mean, situations are going to come and go. They're going to change. You'll be happy one day, sad the next day. That is the rhythm of life. But joy can be constant when you know Christ is your Savior. I want us to pray now. Would you bow with me, please? We're going to sing in a moment. I'm going to stand here at the front of the room. In the first service, a lovely couple came and joined their lives with ours. Maybe you're ready to do that. God has led you to First Baptist week after week, and you feel at home here, and you want to plant your life with us for however long you live here. Maybe you're only going to be in our city a couple of years, but come on, join with us. If you've believed in Jesus for a long time but never publicly <laughs> confessed Him as Savior and Lord, why don't you come? We'll baptize you in days to come as a testimony of that commitment you've made. Father, I pray that you would speak to every heart in life now and call men and women, boys and girls, to yourself. Give people courage to respond and give them much joy in answering your call. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing together, and I'll wait for you. We join in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed is your name. Father God, we come before you this special Christmas week, acknowledge you as the creator and honoring your encouragement to worship and fellowship with one another. We are humbled that on the day we call Christmas, we receive the gift of salvation, the greatest gift, a joy. We are awed and blessed by the birth the sacrifice and the resurrection, and we are humbled by the incredible sacrifice that was made for the forgiveness of our sins. We praise you for that miracle and for the comfort that it brings. We are thankful that we can meet together in safety in your name today. Thank you for the blessings of this time together, the message received, and the joy that indeed we receive in this season. Father God, at this point in our worship service, we bring to you your tithes and our offerings. Thank you that we may return a portion of what 
you have provided to us. We pray that this effort is acceptable to you and ask that you bless these funds to the work and to the strengthening of your kingdom. And we lift up this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hello, my name is Robert. My family lives in Southeast Asia. My sister, brother, and I love to play outside in our banana trees. It gets really hot here, so we have to drink a lot of water. In America, you just go to the tap, but we can't do that here. Our water is dirty. If you drink it, you'll get sick. In the villages, where our family goes to tell people about Jesus, their water is really dirty. People can even die from drinking bad water. We want to save people's lives and let them know that Jesus loves them. So we make these pots that turn dirty water into clean. They look like flower pots, but they are made in a special way. Here, let me show you. We take these bricks and crush them. This is my favorite part. Then we mix it with water to make clay. 
There's a machine that squishes it into the shape of a flower pot. We let it dry and then we bake it in a really, really hot oven. Then we test every pot to make sure it works. Listen, that sound means it's done. Mom and Dad take these pots into the village. When they give the pots, they also tell about Jesus. When they tell about Jesus, most people change, but not everyone does. Most people don't believe in Jesus here. So you can pray for the people to know that Jesus loves them. When you give a pot, it's like you're a superhero saving lives and telling them about Jesus. And that's really a hero in Christ.